And I, I look, Argentina could spend a whole episode just talking about the yin yang and the whipsawing, the yo yoing of being a currency pegged to the dollar and then political changes, political regimes left or right, and then defaults. I mean, in, 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 in Argentina's inflation, I mean, 20 years ago, a dollar could get you, or, you know, a peso could get you 98 cents. Now a peso can get you two cents. I mean, they've suffered extraordinary inflation and extraordinary interest rates. And now they've got an election where they want to get back to the dollar. Uh, which would make Brent Johnson very happy because I agree with the milkshake theory that there is no better currency in this slaughterhouse in this in this it's the best horse in the glue factory than the U.S. dollar. It's certainly not going to be the euro, the yuan, the peso, uh, the French, uh, even the 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 uh, Swiss franc uh, or the yen. So if you're going to need a stable currency, it is going to be that dollar. Welcome back to Soar Financially. Welcome back and thanks so much for joining us here. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the host of Soar Financially, obviously, and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. Thanks so much for joining us. We have a fantastic discussion lined up again today. It's a bit of a follow-up to a discussion we had in May, actually, of this year in person. It's with Matthew Pieperberg. He's the partner over at Matterhorn Asset Management and uh, had the great pleasure of having dinner with Matthew last week in Zurich as well. And we had a wide range of uh, topics to, to discuss because so much going on in the world right now. And we're trying to recap a little bit of it here uh, during our conversation over the next 30, 40 minutes as well. But of course, there are some some very current trends happening in the markets right now. We've just seen the results of the Argentinian election come out. And it's time to talk about that, especially one of the of what you call them political promises here that, that we need to sort of throw into context and discuss. Now, Matthew, it's great to see you. Uh, welcome back on the channel. Thanks so much for joining Hi. me. Kai, it's great to be back, as always, always. Absolutely. I always look forward to our discussions because they're profound. I love them. So, um, but uh, before we dive into like the, the what, what do you call it, the, the daily hot topic, right? Um, mm -hmm. let, let's start with a bit of a summary and uh, the bit of a summary of the market right now. How do you, how do you feel the economy is doing right now, Matthew? Uh, again, the economies and the markets are two different conversations. I think the economy is, and I joke many times like a Truman show, there's the reality and then there's what's felt on the ground and then there's the reality of what's felt on the ground versus what the pundits are saying or what the politicals are saying. And there's debates about a recession or a looming recession or a hard landing or a soft landing. I think empirically, both of those debates are somewhat specious in a sense because I, in, in my mind, and again, it's not just the gloom and doom, gold uh, bug, executive bias talking in his book. In my mind, the, the data suggests we're already deep into a very hard landing and deep into a recession. And we can get into the specifics of that, but um, you know, the the debt spiral that the the sovereign bond markets in general are in and the US bond market in particular is in. Uh, the mismatch between supply and demand, the devastation on Main Street, whether you're looking at, you know, bankruptcies, layoffs, whether you're looking at repo of cars and, and credit cards at 20 percent interest rates and, and, and Main Street citizens just suffering at levels that make, you know, the Oliver Anthony song 90 million hits on YouTube. This idea that we're in a resilient economy or in a strong economy, I think, is simply empirically and mathematically not true. I think when you look at the Conference Board of Leading Indicators, the year-over-year -year change in the money supply, um, when you look at the Fitch downgrade, when you when you look at um, so many indicators, uh, we're already deeply in a recession. So no, my view is consistently the same. It's negative. Some would say sensational, and I respect that. Um, I, I as we talked about in Switzerland, all of us on the table have. You know, we have the right to our own opinions, not our own facts. We all kind of agree on the facts. Our opinions on the dollar or the speed of the dollar's changes and all that are very interesting. But I think we all agree that there's nothing soft about this landing, nothing resilient or robust about the economy. And I don't think that's sensational. I think it's just the real politic of hard math, history, and frankly, common sense. I just wrote an article that came out today at Matterhorn just on, you know, has DC canceled common sense? Because I think... The audience understandably wants good news. They want to hear better news. Certainly the industry that is precious metals is full of a lot of sensationalism and drama. I don't want to be sensational, but I do want to be as at least honest to the facts as I see them. It's my opinion on those facts, but I don't see an easy way out of the debt crisis. I don't think the economy is, is sound or resilient. I don't think we're near a soft landing. I think we're already deep into a hard landing. It's just only going to get dip more difficult. So yeah, that's my macro view and my view on the economy. It's not very positive, sadly, and it hasn't been for a while. The data just keeps getting worse. 
Absolutely. I yeah, know it's a, you know the sky's darkening as as you would say like the, yeah. the indicators are changing on a daily basis and uh, as you said hard versus soft landing that's I think that's the question ignoring the fact that there is even a landing <laughs> landing <laughs> scenario right I think is uh for for lack of a better term almost foolish in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. having yeah. economists in your ear saying, hey, we, we're not going to have a recession, everything's going to be fine, is is not the right way to go. Um, let's yeah. discuss that for a second, hard versus soft line, because I have a question for you prepared, Matthew, is mm -hmm. like, has the Fed and have, has, has Jerome Powell created enough of a cushion maybe to turn a hard into a softer landing? Not a no landing scenario, but a softer landing. I think it's a very important question. I mean, I do agree that he is trying to create a cushion. Uh, and again, we I don't want to get too in the weeds. My, my argument has been for the last year and a half that Powell's war on inflation was a, was a headline rather than a reality. I don't think he was ever really trying to fight inflation. We can get into the CPI scale. It's the open joke on Wall Street that's been overbitten, ever overtouched. But clearly, we're not at 3.2, 3.7, or anywhere near that real, you know, the actual inflation number is much higher than the double digits than that. And that's using the same scale that Volcker used. But getting away from the fact that I don't even believe the inflation scale, CPI, core, are even close to accurate, I do think Powell has been, as he tried to do throughout 2018, reduce the balance sheet while cutting rates. That ended in a disaster at the end of that year. In 2019, went into a pause. And by 2020, we were at unlimited QE. I do think Powell's war on inflation is just a title. I think his real effort has been to, as I've always said, reload the only two guns he has, which is to tighten the balance seat so he can fatten it when we're undeniably in a recession. And he's raising rates now so that he has something to cut when we're undeniably in a recession. Um, you know, if we had gone into a recession at the zero bound with 0% interest rates and a Fed balance sheet over nine and a half trillion, it wouldn't give him a lot of ammunition. So I think what he's been doing over the last year and a half is preparing for the inevitable and reloading those two tools he has. The only two tools or weapons the Fed has is the supply of money and the cost of money. So he's tried to tighten the balance sheet, I think, in a minimal way um, by, you know, QT at the same time that he's raising the fund Fed fund, fund Fed's rate, um, you know, at, at a pace and a slope never seen before. It was too little, too late, too fast, too high. It created a lot of chaos. Again, a lot of hard landings already, whether you're talking about the gilt market last year in the UK, whether you're talking about the banking crisis this year, which people seem to have forgotten, um, or whether you're talking about you know unemployment levels that aren't really reported, whether you're talking about um, bankruptcies in the US now at 400 this year, it's double the average pace of last year. You know, 18 of those bankruptcies have liabilities greater than a billion. 10 of those bankruptcies have at least 200,000 employees behind them. So again, this isn't just trying to find the bad news. When you have bankruptcies, there are employees underneath that, and there's an economy beneath that. So it's not just data. Um, so yes, he's maybe created a cushion to prevent a soft, or excuse me, a hard landing. But again, I would argue that the hard landing is everywhere. And it's the man on Hauptstrasse and Mainstrasse. So people think you know, polo players in Zurich are too removed from Main Street. We're not. I come from Main Street, literally lived on Main Street in Michigan growing up. So I'm not immune to that um, pain. And the people I talk to aren't just hedge fund managers. And whether that's in Germany, France, Switzerland, or the United States, it's not gloom and doom to hear what people have to say, whether they own car dealerships in Ohio or New Hampshire, or whether they have a small business in Massachusetts or Virginia. Um I don't think we can ignore the, the the common sense on the street and the data on the Bloomberg screen. I just can't imagine how they can call this a debate anymore about hard versus soft or recession versus non-recession. According to the Conference Board of Leading Indicators, we were already in recession last December. And frankly, that 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 Conference Board of Leading Indicators is extremely accurate. And then, of course, last year, we also tried to redefine the definition of recession, like we redefine the definition of inflation. It's amazing that, you know, the Fed calls himself data dependent when they frankly openly manipulate the data. And again, John Williams and others who, who look at the, the same scale that Volcker used to measure inflation, we don't use today because it's inconvenient to us. It's, in, it's embarrassing to us. And so again, that may sound like a conspiracy theory or kooky, quacky, you know, gold bull uh, fanaticism, but no, it's just honest math and common sense. And, uh, to your, to your question then, uh, has he created a buffer? He certainly reloaded the, the, the two revolvers a little bit. He tried to do that again in 2018. He's gone further this time. I can criticize Powell all day long and into the next day, but you can play in devil's advocate and say at least someone is trying to take away the punch bowl. He's not just 
doing what everyone else has done from Greenspan onward. Bernanke, you know, Yellen, Powell. I mean, Bernanke to get a Nobel Prize for effectively putting money out of thin air to pay for and monetize debt to me is extraordinary. But you can say Powell is trying to be Volcker in the sense that he's not just catering to Wall Street. I don't believe that, but you can make that argument. It's fair. He's done more than than uh, Bernanke or Yellen did in trying to kind of take away the punch bowl from Wall Street. But again, it's too little too late. And again, it's not even being honest because the Fed, like every central bank, but in particular, the Fed is trapped. They're trapped between a rock and a hard place. Um, there's no way out of a debt crisis. The two key numbers that certainly Americans, but all all citizens of the financial world have to look at because the American 10-year bond is critical and the American currency is the world reserve currency. So what happens in the USA affects everyone, including Argentina, Turkey, and <laughs> including Russia and China or any of the BRICS plus nations. But you know, it's it's simply when you look at the two numbers, 120 and nine, 120 percent debt to GDP levels, that makes growth mathematically impossible. I say it's like swimming with two cannonballs tied to your ankles with a nine percent deficit to GDP ratio. <laughs> that also makes, makes basically makes growth mathematically impossible. So the idea of a soft landing or no hard landing to me is just it's semantics at this point. And I think, as I've always said, and I'll say it and I'll pound my fist over and over, <clears throat> the bond market is the thing. Debt credit is what fuels liquidity, it's what fuels uh, risk assets, it's what fuels economies. But you know, if you look at the corporate bond market in the US, which is an important part of the S&P and the pension funds, 720 billion of those bonds have to be rolled over in 2024, another 1. trillion in 2025. They're going to be rolled over at a higher Fed funds rate. So a lot of those zombie companies that aren't in the top seven, the S&P 7, which is all it really is, the other 493 companies are negative, basically, on an aggregate basis. So when, when those zombies have to refinance their debt at a higher rate in 2024, and then again in 2025, that's when you're going to see the rubber meet the road. In the public debt sector, this is something Jeffrey Gunlack has made very clear. And he is, and if you think the bond market is everything, then I listen to Jeffrey a lot because he knows it better than anyone. Uh, and the public sector debt, you know, the US government debt, well over 33 trillion, just nearing 34 trillion now. We've got another 1.9 trillion in spending before the end of the year, another four to five trillion next year. The mismatch in treasury supplies at a rate growing and climbing at a rate faster than we've seen in 55 years. But even that public debt, 30% of that, which is about 17 trillion today, is going to be repriced in the next 36 months at a higher Powell made rate. Even Uncle Sam can't afford his IOUs. So we're raising the cost of debt while we're issuing more of it at a higher rate. It's an amazing yin yang mismatch between Powell and Yellen, which is ironic that, you know, Yellen is the Secretary of the Treasury. She's a former Fed chair. She's spending like a drunken sailor, and Powell's trying to increase the cost of that spending. And those two, you know, that that Mexican standoff, that chicken fight is going to end in feathers everywhere. It's really ironic that we're deficit spending like crazy while we're raising rates, and then we're arguing about a soft versus hard landing when it's impossible. And when the evidence right now, not even theoretically in the future, is abundantly clear that there's really nothing soft. And so you know, you know, you can create liquidity through, you know, backdoor channels like we did last September when we emptied the TGA account to create a little liquidity. You can create liquidity backdoor by the BTFP program, which effectively allowed commercial banks to get par on their bonds, which Main Street invest on their bonds, which Main Street investors don't get. You know, the 10 year had lost 20 cents on the dollar. Uh, the 30 or 50 cents, that would be very painful for commercial banks unless the system didn't give them par for those otherwise declining assets. So that was a backdoor bailout that was worth trillions, didn't make the headlines, didn't make the discussion. Again, is that me just being sensational or is that just trying to be blunt with, with the mechanizations going on to try and say, be calm, carry on when there's nothing on the ground that suggests it's good now? And I don't see an easy way out uh, for the central banks of the world in general or the US Fed in particular. Um, you know, Luke Roman has done a fantastic job of this, this theme of fiscal dominance. The irony is that Powell's war on inflation, which again is not really the case, he never really was trying to defeat inflation, he was trying to reload his two tools. But even if you take the, uh, the bait that Powell was trying to fight inflation, well, if he's raising the cost of debt of uh, Uncle Sam's IOUs at the same time that, you know, Yellen's expanding that debt, and the White House is expanding that debt, then the cost of our debt becomes so high that the only way to monetize that debt is to print more money. And so that's inherently inflationary. And so Powell's war on inflation is an inherently inflationary policy. Eventually, we're going to have to create some form of liquidity to pay for our own bonds. 
So it's really a series of ironies and contradictions. And frankly, uh, I, I would say, um, it's like, you know, it's just hypocrisy. And, uh, and again, politicians have to come up with clever words and clever scenarios and clever prognoses. I think the man on the street or the man on Wall Street knows better. I mean, years ago in, in Wall Street, we all knew this bond market game was kind of a joke. To Jeffrey's point, we thought it would last till 2070. And we dumped that off on our grandkids. We were making huge bonuses and arbitrages on treasuries that were supported by the Fed. It wasn't a sustainable policy, but now we're in 2023, 2024, and it's already breaking. So the time we thought we'd bought ourselves to get rich quick in a, in a completely distorted, and I say rig to fail Wall Street system, is coming faster than we expected. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't see that Powell is really creating a cushion. He's bought some time. And with the world reserve currency, he can export a lot of that inflation in the interim, put it on the backs of developing and developed friends and foes alike and buy time. But at some point, the treasury market and the currency markets are going to have to have a, a radical moment of, uh-oh, that they've already started. It's only going to get worse. I don't see an easy way out. You know, Hemingway said the best way to get out of this mess is war and inflation. Well, we're seeing that everywhere. Um, we could try and cut spending by 70% on entitlements in the military. I can't imagine a politician will get elected. We could do nothing, go higher for longer, and just watch more things break. Uh, or we could have a Bretton Woods 2.0, which the IMF basically telegraphed in 2020. None of those scenarios are good, and none of them uh, increase our financial or personal liberties. So, again, not very positive outlook, Kai. But uh, I, I, I lean into anyone who can give me a better scenario or so where these numbers are being misinterpreted or where these conclusions could be wrong. Um, so far, none of us, including Brent Johnson, has a very different view on the dollar. Really disagree, though, that the end game here is brutal. It's just a question of how it plays out. I don't see a good scenario. Uh, and again, I get that that's depressing. I get that's not what everyone wants to hear. And I get that people think, well, you're a gold guy, so you want the world to go to hell so you can make money. That's not true. You know, none of us at Matterhorn need the job, frankly, arrogantly need the money. But we're trying to prepare investors uh, for this inflation disaster, this debasement disaster, this debt spiral that we're in. And so people can make their own decisions on these facts, you know, and maybe they have different conclusions. Like I said, we have the right to our own opinions. It's not our own facts. I would probably air this interview in black and white, you know, just to, just because of the mood. Um, Storm no, clouds and lightning bolts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, a lot, a lot of very, very uh, valid points, Matthew. Absolutely. And we all see the indicators. We just need to look at our screen on a daily basis here. Yeah. Um, but one thing, like you, you mentioned as well, is that end game scenario, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking while, while you were talking, it's like in, in mining, when we have too many shares outstanding, we do a rollback, right? right. Meaning we do a 10 for one and to reduce the amount of shares outstanding and that's it. Right. Um, right. I know. And no, but nobody's really happy, especially not existing investors. Right. right. But the management right. is happy because they can raise money at higher rates right. or higher prices. Right. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a prices. I have to yeah. think of that when you were talking about that. But it, at some point, the cost does get too much and we will have to make cuts. Right. Yep. And, and roll right. back the spending to a degree. That's, right. that's I, I had to think of that scenario. Um, <laughs> but, but really, like when I see terms of like end the Fed, for example, Right. Mm -hmm. And right. and overall, in general, like when when poo poo hits the fan at some point, like what, right. what is that going to look like? How is this going to play out? Right. Are we going to see a global financial crisis like in 2007, 2008, with only maybe yeah. parts of the economy affected? Is this going to be mm -hmm. a global phenomenon this time? Right. How mm -hmm. do you see that playing out? And like what does uh, let's call it crash plus day with day one look like, like the next day after? Yeah, look, I'd love to wear an end the Fed hat and T-shirt, but I know realistically that's not going to happen. If you want to talk about a bank that's too big to fail, it's the Fed. I mean, short of just complete anarchy, complete social revolution, financial revolution, and upturning of everything, which I don't see or want. Nobody wants that because uh, it's one thing to talk about disgust in the corruption and the mismanagement of our monetary policies or even our political leaders, left, right, or center. It's one thing to be angry politically. But the alternative is so chaotic that no one really wins. Uh, we need systems. We need we need division of power. We need branches of government. We need a. I don't think the Fed should be a fourth branch of government. I definitely think it's a distortive, uh, corruptive, corrosive, horrific organization from its inception. Which, if you look at the origins of its inception, it's incredibly corrupt. But I also think it's not going to go anywhere. And I do think when things go very wrong, 
uh, we could have a better Fed policymakers. We could have a better Fed chair. We could have more honest politicians, but that's completely Pollyannish. That's just not probably going to happen. I, I would like to believe it. I think what will happen uh, after you know markets tank on the weight of these rates and on the inevitable conclusion of these debt games and then the synthetic creation of liquidity to save those markets, to save that system, to save those bonds, to compress those yields, which is inevitable, short of a, a major Bretton Woods 2.0, which again, would be blaming all of this debt living beyond our means in debt. It will be, it will be blaming it on a geopolitical event like Ukraine, or maybe what happens and continues to happen out of the Middle East. It will be blamed on the extraordinary disaster that was COVID, which the IMF has compared to World War II. And as I've said in many interviews in the past, comparing COVID to World War II and the destruction of Europe and and the costs in lives and dollars, which is just an abstraction, COVID doesn't even come close. And yet the IMF is already ready to use the COVID disaster. I think the policy was as much a disaster as the virus. But that aside, to compare COVID to World War II, especially to anyone whose grandparents fought in that war on any side under any flag, whether they were in the US or in Europe, it's an insult to history. It's an insult to the men and women who suffered through that, the families that suffered through that. But they will use those type of uh, those type of events, Putin, uh, you know, COVID, maybe uh, invasion of Martians from outer space threatening us, or maybe an escalation of a war in the Middle East. They'll use any excuse they can other than the simple fact is they, they let debt get beyond their control. Uh, they tried to support the natural supply and demand forces, of the bond market with synthetic forces from a central bank. Uh, you know, like I said, if you give if you give a teenager your credit card, he's going to look real popular and real successful and real well dressed. And the kegs will always be full and the parties will always be going. But that only lasts until the bill is due and you can extend and pretend and kick that bill down the road. But you're only passing that on to another generation and you're only going to do it at the expense of your currency. Without exception, every great nation, regime, empire, king, good or bad or ugly, has had to try and save its system by debasing its currency, whether that was a Roman coin or whether that was a Deutschmark in the 30s or whether that was a Yugoslavian currency in the 1990s or whether it's the U.S. dollar today. At some point, they will debase, the, they're continuing, they have been debasing it since 1971 at a record pace. The inherent purchasing power of your currency is sacrificed to save your system. And then the reason for that is blamed on anything but the leadership of that monetary policy. They'll blame it on something outside their borders or outside their control to avoid accountability. I mean, even a 14-year-old or an eight-year-old with his hand in the cookie jar and mom catches him in the kitchen will admit, okay, I took the cookie. It's amazing how politicians are allergic to accountability, allergic to saying, God, I got that wrong. I messed that one up. We all messed that up. We're sorry. Now we have to have austerity. Now we have to tighten our belts. Unfortunately, when your debt to GDP is 120%, it's a little late to talk about bite belt tightening. And I say a family, a board at a corporation, a small business, uh, a couple with common sense can just say, look, this is our income. This is our debt. These are the changes that have to be made. We either have to increase our income or we have to reduce our spending to, to get by. And, and, and individuals, humans have that common sense. Politicians, central bankers, uh, they don't. And when they get stuck in a corner, they'll do what, you know, uh, that famous uh, European commissioner was a Claude Juncker. He just said, look, when the date is bad, we just lie. We just are the kid with our hand in our cookie jar who can't just say, OK, you caught me. We got to change. We got to change. Instead, they're going to roll us into ever more and more uh, platitudes, ever more extend and pretend, or some type of reset, Bretton Woods 2.0 like reset, which is inevitable when things that are breaking now break to the point where even they can't ignore it. You know, and the smoke and the rubble is there. The social unrest is already there. The inflation is already there. The bond market distortion is already there. The central bank distrust is already there. That's why other countries are stacking physical gold and dumping U.S. Treasuries at record levels. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, the solutions are hard uh, and the profile is encouraged for policymakers, whether they're in the White House or in a central bank or in the Brussels or in Berlin or they have to. I think they have to sit down with their population and, and, and be honest, be more transparent about mistakes made and, and, and solutions are going to involve pain. Um, and it's not just tax hikes. I mean, the Obama program was effectively a tax hike, and even the Supreme Court recognized it as effectively a tax hike. Then our deficits exploded the next two years. So just taxing the rich or taxing more 
Uh, it's ironic, you know, that even U.S. employment, a lot of the employment numbers came through were government jobs, and most of those were IRS jobs, so they can go after finding more ways to get money out of the people. But it's, it's there's going to be more than just taxing the rich or raising taxes. Going to be it's going to have to be massive cutting and spending and more productivity in the U.S. We have to bring manufacturing back to our own country. We we're a service economy. We don't have a a P in our GDP. We don't produce like we used to. We outsource that to China. If I said so many times, the American dream is made in China. We can't even blame that on the W2O accords and what Clinton did in 2000, 2001. We can blame that on our CEOs at our big fat corporations who said, look, you know, slavery may have been outlawed, but we can still get much cheaper labor in China. And that worked for a while. So everything that's made in America isn't made in America. It's made in China. So these were mistakes made at the, at the grassroots level, at the CEO suite, C-suite level. And at the at the White House level or at the Brussels level, can I jump in ignoring. real quick? Because you mm -hmm. say, well, you're blaming the CEOs. Can I, can I also blame the, the investors who have a quarterly outlook and just sure. say, hey, we we want uh, sure. you know maximize profits. We want to see sure. fat dividend, right? Yeah. So we, you yeah. have to deliver at a cheaper cost. So I think it's the whole ecosystem yeah. with the quarterly thinking, of course, as well. Sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to throw that in there because no, I think it's, it's very important. A big part. I think it's too easy for us to just blame the policymakers. There's plenty of blame to go around. And, it's, and it, we certainly can blame the absolute irrational greed of our C-suite, which is, you know, when you look at when my grandfather was an executive at Ford in the 30s and 40s, the ratio of what a manager made to his man, immediate employee was 32 to 1. Now it's 320 to 1. And in Bezos's case, it's 1.2 million to 1. I'm a massive capitalist. I do not believe socialism has ever worked. Communism has never worked. But what we have is way past rational capitalism. And what we have is a, is a distortion uh, and a corporate greed that's never been seen before in our country or countries. So, yeah, it's not just the policymakers. Uh, they, they gave Wall Street the biggest punch bowl in history. Wall Street took it. Main Street investors wanted it. But again, I'm a champion of the middle class. I'm a champion of Stevensville, Michigan, where I grew up. I'm a champion of the, you know, that class of Americans and the veterans because I remember that world. I'm still very much a part of that world. But even the SMP, which rocketed since 2009 on the back of Bernanke and Yellen and Powell's ridiculous low rate policy, you know, 600 percent increase in the SMP. Don't forget that the, only the top 10 percent of the U.S. population benefited from that bubble. So that's why you have social unrest. That's why you have guitar players in Farmville, Michigan saying, what the hell? Because they're not benefiting. And meanwhile, America, like many, in particular America, is just dividing itself over beer cans and transgender bathrooms and left versus right debates. And understandably, they're so fractured and disunited. Uh, there's really... There's really a great deal of social unrest. And so, again, a lot of that is economics driven. Uh, some of it's politically driven. But... Um, there are there are faults um, at every level, from the investor level to the policymaker levels to the central bank levels. I do think there's a large percentage of the population who are not at fault at all. They're just trying to pay a mortgage, trying to pay a 20% interest rate on their credit cards. They're having to give up their automobiles at record levels right now. We're seeing more delinquencies in autos in the U.S. than we saw in 2008. I think this is important, you know. And again, you can be a polo player living in Zurich or the south of France. I don't forget. And no one should forget that the core of our GDP and the core of our stability, whether you're in the top 10 percent or the bottom 50 percent, there has to be better wealth equality and there has to be a fair, more transparent political system and a more honest uh, policy from the from the central banks. And so we are seeing the social and financial consequences of living beyond our means as a government. And, and yeah, some investors have, have jumped in, too. They want to believe that this deficits without tears is eternal that you can print money without consequence to keep the markets forever up and to the right which technically you can but not without killing your currency hence my interest in precious metals yes my service is for high net worth clients but anyone watching this can still acquire gold and silver if they're only, whether it's in a folgers can under their bed or in some fancy vault in the swiss alps it's still a solution it's not the only solution I'm not saying that but there are things we have to do commonsensically. Even tips don't offer protection because tips are tied to the CPI, which is an open faced lie. So there's not a lot of options left. And it's frustrating. It's not the end of the world, but it is a conversation worth having, whether you're from Wall Street or whether you're on Main Street. And I think more and more people are starting to understand this. They're emotional. They're angry. Something's wrong in the force. But when you just see simple things like we live way beyond our means, our debt to GDP as a country is 120 percent. That's absurd. 
uh, what it costs to pay our deficits is absurd. What would just happen in the November auction for U.S. 30-year treasuries is absurd. Primary dealers and banks had to buy 25% of the bonds that nobody else wanted. That's twice the average level. And that just bought us five days of coverage for our deficit. We, how are we going to get through the rest of the year? We're going to have to keep creating more fake money out of thin air. This is not sensationalism. It's just complex primary dealers, you know, interest on excess reserves, how central banks work. That's why I wrote Rig to Fail. Once you know the system, as Henry Ford says, it's going to be revolution. I don't mean that to be exaggerated. I'm not, I'm not trying to push revolution. But if people understand fractional reserve banking or the Fed or how central banks work with commercial banks and how they're destroying your currency, it's not sensational. It's just, it's just ugly. And um, again, when you get to these debt levels now, I don't see an easy way out. And I'm not trying to say that to push my book or sell my, my asset. I'd hate to be a bond trader at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan or B of A or Citi right now. You can't do that with a straight face. Um, and even if we support the bond market and lift bond prices to bring yields down to, to save the system, we're going to have to print so much money to get those yields down. We're going to debase our currency. So I don't see a win. I don't see a good scenario here other than, like I said, drastic spending cuts, which will be politically suicidal for the squawk boxes, left, right, or center in, in, in politics. So they won't do it. They'll just blame it on something else. And to Hemingway's point, probably distract us in some extended war or state of constant war, which I've known ever since I was born. No, Vietnam absolutely. to the Ukraine. Absolutely. Grim, grim scenarios here. Um, you, you raised the topic of currency uh, mm -hmm. a, a couple of times in, in your answer here and uh, quite, quite topical today because uh, Argentina just went through an election and the, pre the new, the new yeah. president wants to peg his country's currency to, or actually he wants to get rid of his currency and substitute with the US dollar. And uh, yeah. back in back in May, when we chatted in Frankfurt, sitting down with Alistair McLeod, the de-dollarization topic was everywhere, even in mainstream media. Um, that yeah. has faded quite a bit. And uh, yeah. what Mile said, the, the new president of Argentina is also interesting because it, it keeps it's the opposite of a de-dollarization trend. He wants to bring <laughs> the dollar back right in, yeah. into his country because yeah. he believes it's a stable currency. Like, mm -hmm. how does that all fit together? And uh, let's talk about the U.S. dollar here for a second. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And, and homage to Argentina. I'm drinking my mate tea right now. I mean, I have a lot of good friends in Argentina uh, through my horse obsessions. And uh, and I and I look, Argentina could spend a whole episode just talking about the yin yang and the whipsawing, the yo yoing of being a currency pegged to the dollar and then political changes, political regimes left or right. And then defaults and in, 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 in Argentina's inflation. I mean, 20 years ago, a dollar could get you, or, you know, a peso could get you 98 cents. Now a peso can get you two cents. I mean, they've suffered extraordinary inflation and extraordinary interest rates. And now they've got an election where they want to get back to the dollar, uh, which would make Brent Johnson very happy because I agree with the milkshake theory that there is no better currency in this slaughterhouse in this, in this, it's the best horse in the glue factory than the U S dollar. It's certainly not going to be the Euro the yuan, the peso, uh, the French, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, Swiss franc uh, or the yen. So if you're going to need a stable currency, it is going to be that dollar. Uh, there's a lot wrong with that thesis in the long run. Just the math of restructuring, repegging the peso in Argentina, the U.S. dollar. I don't see how that happens. Uh, I don't see how that happens without without massive dislocation in pricing and a shock to the Argentine currency. You can't just suddenly peg one to one to the dollar when you owe that much money in US dollar denominated debt and you don't have the money in your own country. So it's not pretty, it's politically expedient to say that. And it is the best currency in the glue, in the glue factory, so to speak, but it's not an instant solution. The other thing that you talked about, the de-dollarization theme that was really large and looming when you and I spoke back in Frankfurt with uh, Alistair McLeod, you know, that was a month prior to the BRICS summit in South Africa and this whole, in my opinion, hype that there was going to be a gold-backed BRICS currency. That was never going to happen for a number of reasons. I said it before, I said it after. Alistair had a different opinion um, whether that would happen. I still think gold doesn't have to be a, uh, a the backing of a BRICS currency to play a far more important role in the BRICS countries, which include Argentina. Real assets and commodities have mo far more power uh, in their blocks than it, than they do in New York or London exchanges. So the BRICS and the BRICS plus nations don't have to have a gold backed BRICS currency to use gold to arbitrage the Delta and the difference between their assets and their trades. They don't need a BRICS backed currency, real assets in general and gold in particular are playing a bigger role. That's why central banks in the East are stacking gold at record levels and dumping us treasuries at record levels. 
uh, there doesn't have to be a gold backed currency and there doesn't have to be de dollarization. As I've always said, and I, from the moment the sanctions started against Russia, Grant Williams and I and many others said, Jim Rickard said it right after this is a watershed moment in the US dollar. It is an inevitable and irrevocable change in the trust of the US dollar and the use of the US dollar. It never meant the end of the US dollar as a world reserve currency or as a principal settlement of trading exchanges. Of course not. Just like 1971 didn't mean the end of the US dollar, it just meant the end of the inherent, inherent purchasing power of the US dollar, which since 1971 has lost 98% of its inherent purchasing power when measured against gold. So, you know, Nixon didn't kill the dollar, he just neutered it. And what happened with the sanctions in 2022 didn't kill the dollar, it just changed it. Its status, its hegemony has been irrevocably changed. Its supremacy has not changed. And there's a difference. But what I'm saying is the process of de-dollarization is extremely slow. And if you are going to pick a currency to peg against, whether you're Argentina or Japan or, or you know, uh, Qatar or Bahrain, you're going to use the U.S. dollar directly or indirectly because there is no better option. That doesn't mean, though, that that once beautiful prom date that you thought you wanted to invite in the fall isn't going to be the same in the spring or the summer of next year. And there's absolutely no doubt that the respect and trust for the U.S. dollar is irrevocably changed. It never was going to happen in 24 months, and it didn't require a gold-backed BRICS currency to make this happen. Um, and this is where you talk about the U.S. dollar, and this is the great, important debate. Um, you know, Brent Johnson and I have very different views on the end game near term for the U.S. dollar, and his milkshake theory, I think, is incredibly well-informed and incredibly important. And his basic thesis, I'm not going to speak for him because he can do it better than me, is, and I agree to a large extent, the U.S. dollar has this great big sucking straw. There's a need for it throughout the world. There's trillions, there's over 14 trillion in U.S. dollar in debt in out throughout the world, not just to U.S. banks. Uh, it's these major account for SWIFT exchanges. The U.S. controls the flow of trade flows to the SWIFT exchanges with all the major banks. Um, there's the petrodollar, which is a massive demand, which I don't think is as safe as it used to be, but it's still very much there. Um, there is no doubt that there is a lot of ways in which the U.S. dollar is still preeminent and will be preeminent. But there's also no doubt that many countries, over 44 now, are entering bilateral agreements outside of the U.S. dollar. There's no doubt that China can now buy oil from Russia, pay for that in yuan, which Russia can then go to the Shanghai exchange and convert into gold. There's no doubt that's a seismic shift. There's no doubt that there's something important about Saudi Arabia and the UAE joining the BRICS. Saudi Arabia and OPEC are very important to the petrodollar system. I don't think the petrodollar ends tomorrow, but the U.S. dollar isn't what it was when Nixon and Kissinger tried to you know, convince OPEC to use it as to peg it as the petrodollar. Those things are in slow but irrevocable change. There's no doubt that China, the Chinese uh, did a 27 year deal with Qatar to buy liquid natural gas. They dumped U.S. treasuries 10 years to buy that liquid national natural gas because they'd rather have 27 years of liquid national liquid natural gas than 10 more seconds of a declining asset like the U.S. Treasury. They don't want to have the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury uh, be the tag, the, the tail that wags their dog all the time. But again, to Brent Johnson's point, U.S. you know the U.S. dollar is key to the derivative markets. That's a huge sucking sound for dollar liquidity. You need dollars. The euro dollar markets, all these accounts and banks outside of the U.S. They need liquidity constantly. They need that U.S. dollar. So there is a strong demand for that otherwise embarrassing dollar. And and and, and Brent Johnson, who sees a DXY at possibly 130, 140, doesn't have a lot of respect for the dollar. He's just realistically saying, but that dollar is necessary. And to Argentina's example, it's the one you're going to choose when things hit the fan. I totally agree. But where I disagree is I think the speed of disrespect for that dollar, it's, as Hemingway described poverty, it starts slowly, then happens all at once. We're seeing so many signs of countries and systems moving away from that dollar. It never was going to happen overnight. It will not happen overnight. As I said last year with Ronnie Sturfel and Grant, and Grant Williams and others, it's, but it's irrevocable. It's a watershed moment in the history of the U.S. dollar. And again, just look, I, I use the analogy when, you know, look at European history or even the U.S. Civil War. When there's a nation coming near your border, what do you do? You bring your cannons, your horses, and your infantry near the border to protect that border. And what we're seeing now with central banks, in particular in the East, since 2014, they've been net sellers of U.S. treasuries while stacking physical gold. So they're putting their troops in preparation for an invasion. They're stacking physical gold because they see a U.S. dollar being diluted and diluted and diluted, given the debt spiral that the U.S. is in. 
So the armies are concentrating at the borders. The central banks are stacking physical gold. I'm not saying this is a gold trader. I'm saying this is common sense. There's a reason there's been record high purchases in the last couple of years since the sanctions began of central bankers buying more physical gold. Not because the dollar is coming to an end, not because the DXY is going to 60, but because the US dollar will never be what it used to be. Never. And I think that's not sensationalism. That's just a change. Empires usually last about 250 years. The USA is not going anywhere, but it's going broke. It's just empirically, empirically going broke. And the only way to sustain its system, it's absolutely a central bond market, which fuels the risk asset credit and equity markets, this S&P, which, which fuels our economy and which certainly fuels our pension systems, et cetera, and our bond market. The only way to save that is to have some natural buyer. If there's no natural buyer, you'll have an unnatural buyer. You have to print money out of thin air to then support that bond market, which supports that pension market, that S&P, that stock market. The system needs that bond market to be bought. And since no one else is buying it in enough volume, we will create more synthetic liquidity to monetize our own debt that will inherently be inflationary longer term. We may have a disinflationary period of a stock market crash to blame it on somebody else. We will have disinflationary or deflationary cycles, but the end game is always in the Vidas Glaica, the same throughout history, debase your currency. The wheelbarrows in Weimar are an exaggeration, but that's the basic principle behind uh, US policy. Now, Weimar Germany wasn't the world reserve currency in the 30s. The Deutsche Mark wasn't the world reserve currency. Today, the US dollar is. And to Brent Johnson's point, that gives it immense power. And I don't disagree, but I think the speed and change in the US dollar, regardless of what Argentina, bless their hearts, but regardless of what they try to do, isn't going to be enough. Uh, and uh, I think um, I think we'll see some type of reset blamed on something else to try and have like a Plaza Accords at some point or a Bretton Woods 2.0, which the IMF has already telegraphed because there is no natural or even unnatural way to get out of this because the unnatural way monetizing debt through synthetic liquidity liquidity is absolutely cancerous to our currency. Sadly, that's the, that's the next step. And then they'll have a a reset uh-oh moment blamed on everything else but themselves to try and solve it so it sounds a bit like japan to me what you what you've described right uh, japan 260 percent exactly double right now uh debt yep. to gdp uh currency yep. completely devalued used to be a massive anchor in the world economy completely yep. disappeared from the world uh from the grand stage pretty much yeah uh just a just a side note now uh doesn't even get mentioned anymore when you talk about swift trading volumes or anything so right. Um, right. Is that Japan, like maybe as a last point of discussion here, is Japan that blueprint we have to fear and look forward to? Yeah, Japan is a fascinating story. I mean, look what they've done. You know, the JGB is cr critical to their system. Japanese government bond is critical. Their, their citizens buy it like it's, it's safety. It's, that's their safe asset, like our 10-year U.S. Treasury used to be in my father's and grandfather's era. They can't let that system die. They can't let those yields go too high. So what have they done? They've crushed their currency. I mean, they've crushed the yen this year. It would almost be price fixing if the Fed probably wasn't in cahoots. They're allowing it. Uh, Japan, unlike the U.S., though, has a net invest international investment position that's five, significantly positive. Their piggy bank is offshore. It's in U.S. markets. They want to see U.S. markets do well because that's where a lot of their assets are. But they still have to dump U.S. treasuries to, to, to buy their own currency to keep it alive. But they've effectively decided, we're just going to let that currency sink, which actually is good for their exports. And it keeps their bond market alive because that's essential to their survival. It's another example, once again, of letting your of letting your, your currency fall on the sword, sacrificing your currency to save your system. I, I look at Japan. I mean, it's fascinating. It hasn't really, really, even its architecture hasn't changed since the Nikkei crash in 89. It's just stuck. It's in limbo. And what it's really become is a market maker for Wall Street. It's like its own prop desk for American uh, carry trades. I mean, yeah, of course, the big guys in Wall Street and hedge funds are taking out loans at low interest rates in, in Japan so they can lever that and arbitrage it to buy more shares in the U.S. And Japan probably doesn't mind because a lot of their assets are in U.S. markets. So it's really Japan's become an offshore bank for, for Wall Street in a sense, and they've saved their system by completely gut-punching their currency. But they're not the world reserve currency. They can do that, and, and, they, and yet it still hurts. The U.S. can, can instead of in basing its currency and inflating away in an embarrassing way, can simply export that currency, ironically, to places like Argentina, who have been the, the you know, they've been, we've been the tail that wags their dog. 
you know, they, they, they peg their loans in U.S. dollars and rates go up and then they can't make those payments and they have to, you know, mortgage off more of their assets or go into more and more social unrest or political distress. So the U.S. dollar had, you know, that famous quote by uh, Connolly. I think it was the Shastang or to uh, one of the, maybe it was to De Gaulle, but he said, you know, it's our currency, but it's your problem. That's the arrogance of the world reserve currency, the arrogance of the 1944 Bretton Woods America that had saved with Russia's support of Europe from fascism and brought democracy to the world. That arrogance that Connolly put, pulled out in the 60s or 70s, it's our currency, your problem. Well, that is absolutely true. It's our currency. It's been Argentina's problem. It's been Turkey's problem. It's been Europe's problem. It's been Japan's problem. But I'd argue that it's our currency, our problem now, because we've gone so far past the Rubicon of common sense that even our bond market, like the Japanese bond market, will need more synthetic support short of a massive, massive spending cut, short of a, a, a you know, a Bretton Woods 2.0, short of cutting military expenditures massively, and, and short of um, finding a solution to oil, like in a, in a magical battery that's cheap and can replace oil. So short of those mirac miracle or politically suicidal solutions, America will reach its point where it too will devalue its currency. And, and that's why even Brent Johnson, and I agree that the best asset you can own is a physical precious metal. And again, everyone will say, Matt, you're just talking your book. Brent's, well, Brent's talking his book. No, Brent has a much more complex problem. He's managing assets, not just physical and precious metals. It's a far harder responsibility in this environment to go long and short uh, volatility in these times. So Brent and I aren't just colluding to push gold. And, you know, a lot of guys on Wall Street from Paul Tudor Jones to Jeremy Grantham, these, they're not pushing gold. We're just buying it because we don't trust our currency. And so it, you got to get past the gold bug, gold, you know, bull hype because there's plenty of it. It just comes back to common sense. You've got to protect the inherent purchasing power of your currency in Germany and Switzerland, and Europe, where our parents and grandparents remember inflation. We remember pain like is unimaginable in the U.S. This is not a radical thought. Uh, America lives in a certain splendid isolation. I certainly did. I still do, in a sense. But you can't be immune to history and its lessons. You can't be immune to the common sense of basic math. And, and that's what you know. I try really hard to push without trying to be sensational. As Rick Rule said, I'm afraid gold's going to go up. That's why I own it. I don't want it to go up. Disingenuous and generous, I think deep down Rick Rule would like to see gold go up. But I think he makes a good point. And Egon and I have said this many times, be careful when gold's at five or 6,000, because who cares? Because by then a loaf of bread's going to cost more too. And there's going to be so much other pain in the world that the talking about gold won't, won't be fun anymore. And, and it's not like you get rich off of gold. If gold goes to 5,000, I don't get richer. It just means I don't get poorer. I don't get poor because I've protected the inherent purchasing power of my currency, whatever that is, dollar or euro or Swiss franc. And I think that's what you know, isn't as sexy as Bitcoin, not against it. It isn't as sexy as a SPAC. It isn't excessi as, as sexy as a hedge fund manager can promise you 20% annualized. They can't do it legally, but they'll promise you that. Uh, none of that is as, sex as sexy when you're trying to make money in this market. I think we're at a point in our debt cycle where the key should be preserving your wealth, generational wealth. I've always known, I learned this when I won the lottery ticket in, in the 2000 dot-com bubble, which I didn't deserve. When you want to have money, the way to the way to be rich is to stay rich. Don't lose money. Whether you're a middle class or you're upper class or you're at the bottom of us, you've got to try to preserve your wealth. That's true universally. The middle class is particularly clipped. But the secret to Wall Street is not to lose money. And uh, the problem is if we're in an inflation environment that's underreported and you're trying to make that money in the S&P, you're going to lose money to inflation and losses in a volatile S&P. There's very few places to go. And that's, that's scary. Um, and again... I'm not trying to say buy gold to get rich. It won't make you rich. Bitcoin can make you a lot richer if it goes where, where it could go. I, I, I don't want to get into Bitcoin because I'm not against it or for it, really. You don't have to be a gold um, you know, bull and, and make fun of Bitcoin. There's a lot of reasons that Bitcoin could be a great speculative trade, uh, possibly even a preservation trade. I'm just saying gold is not sexy. It's a wealth preservation asset. That's it. And that's why in Europe, it's not so hard to hold 10, 15, 20, 25% as insurance, like we have insurance on our homes or our cars or our health. It's just insurance on currency that's openly dying, uh, in my opinion. It's common sense.
Absolutely. Fantastic. Fantastic remarks. Matthew, we're going to wrap it up here. I had another question lined up for you, but uh, I promise you 30 minutes. It's been 48 now because I can chat okay. with you forever. Because like, I talk lots, forever. <laughs> uh, there's lots of good stuff, though. Otherwise, I would jump in, cut you off, or maybe switch to a different scene or something. It's, 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 it's really, really good content, and uh, you, you, you tie it all together as well. So it makes a lot of oh. sense. I think everybody's getting a lot out of this, Matthew, as well. Um, you, you mentioned your uh, recent piece that you published actually just today. You said, uh, where, where can we find it? Where can we find more of you, Matthew? Yeah, my articles with Egon von Greyers, my partner and colleague at Matterhorn, are found on goldswitzerland.com. Uh, all our interviews and articles are posted there. Uh, a lot of times Ronnie Sturf will throw in one of his views in German or English both, and um, it's great. We've got great advisors like Grant Williams, and, and obviously Egon is just an iconic mentor. Uh, we have just a great team. I think what's really critical, though, I think a lot more people are understanding why you need to have gold. Uh, what Egon figured out decades ago is how to have it, how to hold it outside of your zip code in a, in a safe jurisdiction, in a safe vault. I realize that's not true for everyone because uh, we we represent high net worth clients. But we, Egon and I, make a special effort to talk about gold, even when we know it's not for clients that are going to come to us for for Main Street. And, and whether in, you know, you're in Germany or the US or anywhere in the world, you can still find ways to safely own uh, precious metals. And uh, again, it's not going to solve every problem in the world. It's just one solution. And we're very proud to support it. But uh, yeah, we're at goldswitzerland.com. Perfect. Fantastic. Matthew, thank you so much for your time. As always, it's so highly appreciated. I'd love to catch up with you actually early next year because we have pre US presidential elections looming in 2024 sure. as well. Love to get your insights. That was the last topic I wanted to touch on, but oh, that have completely, uh, you know, <laughs> God, we would have completely gone off the rails here, probably. Yeah, so I yeah. we'll, we'll save that one for early January, because uh, I think okay. it's going to be very topical then. Thanks so much Super. for your time. Everybody else. Oh, let me switch the scenes here. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously. I'd love to bring Matthew back uh, in January. Let, let us know what, what you think is going to happen. How is the U.S. dollar going to behave over the next few months, years as well? Is the U.S. going to become the next Japan? What do you think? Put that in the comments below. We want to hear from you. Also, since uh, Ma Matthew already promised to be back on in January, <laughs> put some questions down below. Maybe we, uh, we, we can ask him that as well. So lo lots to discuss, of course. Lots going on. It's very complex out there these days. Uh, it's always been, but it feels like it's more complex than ever. Make sure to watch these channels like ours and others. There's so, there's so much great content out there. Brent Johnson, Grant Williams, and all the other great commentators. Make sure you follow them. Get educated, and we'll be back with lots more. Thanks so much for tuning in.